start. Next one is entitled Celestial Symbols. Celestial Symbols. Symbolism in Doctrine, Religious Traditions, and Temple Architecture by Alan H. Barber. Alan H. Barber. And this is published by Horizon Publishers. Sometimes you get to understand that even the names of the publishers and sometimes the name of the authors are symbolic. Horizon, as you've already learned, means Horus rising. Horizon Publishers and Distributors Incorporated, P.O. Box 490, Bountiful, Utah. And that book contains some revelations. Another one is entitled Many Moons. Many Moons. The Myth and Magic, Fact and Fantasy of Our Nearest Heavenly Body by Diana Bruton. Introduction by Colonel James Irwin of the Apollo 11 mission. <laughs> oh, yes. Gets very interesting. Very interesting. And this is published by Prentice Hall Press, New York, London, Toronto, Sydney, Tokyo, Singapore, so I know you can find this book. Now, we're going to get into some other areas now, and I'm going to attempt to sort of explain to you some of the things that are in these books. And you need to start with some history. The first book that I want to recommend to you is entitled Holy Blood, Holy Grail by Bijant Lincoln and uh, Lee. Bijant, Lincoln, and Lee. Holy Blood, Holy Grail. The next one is the Messianic Legacy. The Messianic Legacy by the same authors by Jean, Lincoln, and Lee. And then there's another one called The Temple and the Lodge. The Temple and the Lodge by the same authors. And then the fourth one by these authors also is called The Dead Sea Scrolls Deception. The Dead Sea Scrolls Deception by the same authors. Now read those books. Read them in that order. The last one just came out. I've just ordered it myself, have not read it, but I know because I've read the other three that uh, I need to read it and it's going to be just as revealing as the first three. Now none of these books put together the whole picture. I've done that. But they all have pieces to the puzzle that you need to find for yourself so that you'll know that I'm not leading you down the garden path. That's important. Now, in that series of books, folks, it outlines the history, as they have discovered it, of a secret society whose sole purpose is to protect the bloodline of the family which traditionally throughout history has claimed the divine right to rule the rest of us. It's important that you know about that family because the same people <laughs> also rule this country, folks. They're all related. If you haven't figured that out yet. And if you want to find out how related they are, start looking into an organization organized in Cincinnati called the Knights of the Golden Circle. The Knights of the Golden Circle. The next book that I want you to pick up and read is entitled Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar. A biography by Michael Grant. Now, in this book, it outlines the a lot of things about ancient Rome, their political machinery, the way that Rome was really ruled by families, which is going to be the same way in the New World Order, I can guarantee you that, and it talks a lot about the ancient religions in this book, 
It's very revealing. It's a biography. It's factual. It's not uh, fiction at all. And you need to read it. The next book is an extremely important book and puts a lot of pieces of the puzzle together. And the person who wrote this book didn't actually set out to even write about this subject. What he was doing was trying to research the peasants' revolt in England and ended up writing a book about Freemasonry because of what he found out in his investigation into the peasants' revolt uh, in England. And that man is John J. Robinson. John J. Robinson. The title of the book is Born in Blood, The Lost Secrets of Freemasonry. Born in Blood, The Lost Secrets of Freemasonry. I'm just going to read to you a little bit from the uh, the dust jacket here. Its mysterious symbols and rituals had been used in secret for centuries before Freemasonry re revealed itself in London in 1717. Once known, Freemasonry spread throughout the world and attracted kings, emperors, and statesmen to take its sacred oaths. It also attracted great revolutionaries such as George Washington and Sam Houston in America, Juarez in Mexico, Garibaldi in Italy, and Bolivar in South America. It was outlawed over the centuries by Hitler, Mussolini, and the Ayatollah Khomeini. But where had this powerful organization come from? What was it doing in those secret centuries before it rose from underground more than 270 years ago? And why was Freemasonry attacked with such intense hatred by the Roman Catholic Church? This amazing detective story answers these questions and proves that the Knights Templar in Britain fleeing arrest and torture by Pope and King formed a secret society of mutual protection that came to be called Freemasonry. Based upon years of meticulous research, this book solves the last remaining mysteries of the Masons, their secret words, symbols, and allegories, whose true meanings had been lost in antiquity with a richly drawn background of the bloody battles, the opportunistic kings and scheming popes, the tortures and religious persecution that were the Middle Ages. It is an important book, that may require that we take a new look at the history of events leading to the Protestant Reformation, and you've already heard <laughs> about that on this show. But you need this book, Born in Blood, The Lost Secrets of Freemasonry. Get it. The next book is by the same author, John J. Robinson. After he wrote Born in Blood, he was intrigued, and so he wrote Born in Blood about Freemasonry, then he had to go back and research the history of the Knights Templar, and he wrote this book entitled Dungeon, Fire, and Sword. Dungeon, Fire, and Sword. The Knights Templar in the Crusades by John J. Robinson, author of Born in Blood. And I'm going to read to you from this flyleaf, but... Uh, yeah, I will. Over the past thousand years, the bloodiest game of King of the Hill has been for supremacy on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, the site of the ancient Temple of Solomon. This book recounts the stirring saga of the Knights Templar, who were called the Christian warrior and monks who occupied the Sacred Mount in the aftermath of the butchery of the First Crusade, recruited to a life of poverty, chastity, and obedience intended to lead only to martyrdom on the battlefield. They were totally dedicated to the pious paradox that the wholesale slaughter of non-believers would earn the eternal gratitude of the Prince of Peace. The Templars amassed great wealth, which they used to finance their 200 years of war against Muslims on the desert, in the mountains, and up the broad sweep of the Nile Valley. The Templars' reward for those two centuries of military martyrdom was to be arrested by Pope and King, tortured by the Inquisition, and finally decreed out of existence. But their legend and legacy just would not die. In telling the incredible story of the Knights Templar, the author's clear explanation of the cultural and religious differences among the Templars' enemies and friends in the Middle East gives fresh understanding of the people who populate this restless region. Here are the Sunnis and the Shiites, the Kurds, the Armenians, the Arabs and Turks, who figure so prominently in today's headlines. The similarity of their antagonisms today and those of 800 years ago are often so striking as to be eerie. Dungeon, Fire, and Sword is a brilliant work of narrative history that can be read as an adventure story, a morality play, or a lesson in the politics of warfare. 
But, folks, be careful when you read these books that you do not believe them blindly. For sometimes the authors are taken in by the exoteric, but you still need to read them. Don't go away, folks. We've got to take our break. I'll be right back after this 